Hello everyone, uh, we've got another video lecture here for Philosophy 115, Critical Thinking. Um, this is the part two to the formal evaluations of arguments module. So this is our little crash course in uh, formal logic that we're going to be doing. And uh, in the last video, you got a, a broad overview of this unit and a lot of the kind of core ideas that are present in like what we're, why are we doing all this formal logic stuff? and how we're going to use a symbol language um, and our ultimate uh, purpose for it being to be able to test arguments for validity. That's that's the whole the whole point of all this. Um, my plan for the lecture today, and we'll see if we can get through everything, um, but the, the main thing I definitely want to make sure we get through is explaining in detail all of the different logical operators that are uh, kind of fleshing out our symbol language. Um, and defining their meanings as the language of symbolic logic understands them. And then, hopefully, and maybe we'll be able to get it all done, um, I'll talk through the translation step. So how we take ideas and arguments from a natural language like English and then translate them into this symbolic form. Um, if you remember from the last video, I was walking through a, a toy example case uh, with that um, example from Clue uh, with an argument that was first given in English then we put it into the symbol language that's the translation step did a truth table of the logical expressions the the logical form of the argument and then evaluated that truth table we use the truth table as the basis for coming to a determination about that arguments of validity those are the kind of crucial three steps and the third step is pretty fast the the two big things are how do you translate things from English into the symbol language, propositional logic, and then how to evaluate logical expressions using truth tables. And I'm going to start with the second one first, and then we're going to go to the first. Um, and like I said in the last video, I think this is the right way to go. I kind of disagree with the book's order of operations here because it's hard to know how to do the translations if you don't know what's going on with the language you're translating things into. Uh, so I, I actually think it's it's cleaner and easier to learn logic than it is to learn English. <laughs> um, and not just because English is a particularly pesky natural language, um, but for any natural language. Um, logic is, is really sleek and elegant. It's stripped down, it's only capturing certain types of meanings, um, and everything is pretty straightforward about how it operates. Uh, we'll talk about some of the idiosyncrasies of logic and some of the things that can be a little counterintuitive at times uh, today, but it's much more straightforward than, than a natural language. So that's the game plan for today. Again, I have Neil in the chat room. Thank you for being here. Um, and uh, ask questions as we go here. Um, and let's get started. Um, so Neil, I'm going to be uh, doing things on that whiteboard again. Um, so I have figured out how to do that screen sharing last time and let's try it again here where did I do that <laughs> um, how did I do that oh here it is share a window oh come on computer All right, are you, oh, not yet. Okay, are you able to see that now, Neil? No, I'm not seeing anything, no change. Uh, okay. Now it looks like it's loading. Now it's loading? Yes. Okay, cool. And when this is up, right, you can't see the video of my face? I can see it on the bottom right. It's still uh, it's still there, but de dead center of my screen is your um, is your uh, application. Okay. Okay. Um, hmm. I'm not able to get that to pop up. Let me do. 
All right, I'm actually going to stop the video here so that I can pull it up on the webcam that comes through the video recorder program I use, Neil. So you'll just hear my voice, but that should be fine. This is logic. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to do that. All right, here we are. So if you remember from the last uh, video, Neil, are you uh, sorry to check in one more time? A technical thing. Are you able to hear my toddler yelling in the background? A little bit. A little bit. It's not too bad. Okay, not let me know major. if it gets bad. Okay. All right. So going back from the last video, I introduced to you all of the major components of our logical symbol language, and they're really just three elements. There are. Um, what we call propositional letters like P, Q, R, and so on. And those letters stand for individual simple propositions, so just a subject and a predicate. The car is red, something like that. And then we've got the logical operators like AND, OR, we're just going to use this as IF THEN, and then if and only if, yep. and the negation, just those elements. And then we've got parentheses. So like this, maybe some, we've got some more varieties here when things get more complicated, like brackets. Um, there we go. And these logical operators, again, I'm, I'm having to use imperfect things off the keyboard. There are symbols for these. Uh, the biconditional should be this triple bar, and really what I'm having as this uh, right pointing bracket should really be a little bit more like a horseshoe here. Um, but that's what we've got uh, as our logical operators. So these are the only elements to our symbol language. Um, the got the simple propositions that you can just make simple propositions, like last time in the argument we had Miss Scarlet is a murderer, and we just threw an S on there to represent that nothing more we had to do there but we can make more complex expressions by combining simple propositions with these logical operators so I was describing how like if I want to say something and something else I can have an and operator there and then it can glue together some other things some other chunks of something those some things could be just simple propositions like I can have P and Q or I can have something that's a little bit more complicated, like one of the expressions we're going to be talking about very shortly here, P or Q, <clears throat> and not P and Q. So in this scenario, you've got um, one chunk here, the P or Q part, <clears throat> that's being glued together with that and, with this part over here, the denial, the negation of P and Q both together. So you, you can also see that I've got some other operators in here. There's more complicated structure. Like this negation is really just modifying this P and Q chunk right here. So all of these operators start making more complex expressions out of very simple ones. Um, I sometimes in the past have used the description here, a metaphor of uh, molecules, like when you see molecules, molecules are, sometimes it's just a simple atom, sometimes it's combined together, like H2O here, you got your hydrogens, and the oxygen here, there's a water molecule. Um, you've got the simple components, those are kind of like the propositional letters, the actual atoms, but then these chemical bonds, those are kind of like the logical operators. It's just that there are a lot of different sort of bonding functions here um, for how propositional letters can be combined. And then the parentheses are just there for bookkeeping to keep straight which chunks are being glued together. And that's pretty important because take the and here. This and blah something and something else. Um, you got each each of those operators and or if then the conditional and the biconditional they always glue together two chunks so you get a syntax error if you had something like 
P and Q or R. This is ambiguous. I don't actually know what the meaning of this is. I don't know whether what I'm supposed to interpret here is that there are two possibilities. P and Q are both true or R is true. Or alternatively, whether it's telling me P is true and it's also true that either Q or R is true. We put the parentheses like that. So we, we've got to use the parentheses here to identify what are the chunks that are getting glued together with um, logical operators. Um, Neil, so far so good on this? This is just a bit of recap and how are you feeling? I'm feeling good, yeah. It makes uh, sense, you yeah. know last uh, Thursday on the lecture in the parentheses, yeah, it's, uh, it's making sense. Okay, cool. Um, when I was doing truth tables last time, I was kind of just running through it a little fast, and I, and I was choosing things that are more or less intuitive um, to work with here in terms of how we calculate truth values. But I want to go back to that mode and go over it in much more detail here so you can see how these things really break down. Um, to understand... Okay, here, here's the, uh, the big idea, the first really, really big idea for today's lecture and for just understanding formal logic. When we're talking about defining the meaning of a logical expression in a formal logic language, the meaning is going to come from the truth conditions for the expression, the conditions under which a claim is true versus the conditions under which it's false. So if we have here... Imagine true on one side, false on another side, and then there's a kind of line drawing between them. So the cases under which the statement is true versus the cases under which it's false are defining of its logical meaning. And actually, this might not just be true for logic, but this could be true for all language. Um, I've seen some philosophical theories here that use truth conditions as the way to understand the meaning of anything that we say. So take, for example, um, and, and also that I can tie in another theme here. In the last lecture, I mentioned that logic isn't going to tell you whether things are true or false, just about what are the possibilities, right? So if I tell you this statement here, I might have used this one before. Um, I make the claim, uh, there are aliens on Alpha Centauri that like Nicolas Cage movies. That claim, I don't know if that's true or false, and I don't think you do either. <laughs> I don't think anyone here on Earth is in a position to be able to render a verdict about that proposition. However, we still know what it means. And in fact, if we didn't know it was what it means, we wouldn't be in a position to make the judgment we don't know it. right? To, to say we're ignorant of whether it's true or false. We wouldn't be in a position to evaluate that if we didn't know what the claim was saying. Like what it is representing. What state of affairs is it representing. And one way to understand the way in which that statement is intelligible to us is that even if we don't know whether it is true versus false, we still know what, under what circumstances the statement would be true and under what circumstances the statement would be false. So, for example, if there are no aliens on Alpha Centauri, then to make the claim there are aliens on Alpha Centauri that like Nicolas Cage movies would be a false statement. Or if there were aliens on Alpha Centauri, but they have never had any contact with anything from planet Earth, that also would be a case under which it's false. Or, there are aliens, they have had contact with, with stuff from Earth, and they've seen Nicolas Cage movies, and they think they suck. That would also be a circumstance under which the statement is false. And we can imagine cases under which it's true as well. So, uh, it might not be that big of a stretch here to say that when it comes to anything that we say, in, expressed in any language, whenever we make a claim under any language, the actual thing that defines the meaning of that claim comes down to the range of cases under which it would be true versus the range of cases under which it would be false. So, but that, uh, regardless of whether you buy that as an argument for semantics generally, it is definitely how formal logic works that will define, like this statement here, I got this uh, this goofy one, P or Q and not P and Q. That might just look like a string of symbols right now. But if we're going to understand the meaning of this string of symbols, it'll come down to under what cases does this statement come out true and under what uh, conditions does it come out false. So let's, let's go back to how we can represent this. Um, and I showed you this in the last video. We'll make 
a truth table. And if you remember from how I drew this up before, on the far left side here, I said the far left side is all about the possibilities, just setting up the possible conditions for things. So if we have statements that involve the simple proposition P and the simple proposition Q, or really the P's and Q's can just stand for any blahs at all, right? It could just be here's the P chunk and here's the Q chunk. There's a really fun way in which logic is recursive like this. More on that a little bit later. Um, but if we got two components that are being glued together by a proposition, uh, by a logical operator, for example, P and Q, that's a logical expression. Or we could have P or Q, and we'll just start with these two for right now. Um, if we want to know what these things actually mean, if we want to define the function of this logical operator, we'll want to see the conditions under which these statements come out true and false. And in order to do that, again, we want to have an exhaustive account of all the possibilities. So one possibility is when P and Q are both true. Another possibility is when P is true but Q is false. Another one is when P is false and Q is true. And the last possible combination here is if they are both false. I'm not sure I gave you this metaphor last time, but you can think about um, calculating these possibilities um, using this metaphor. I'm going to draw here. Uh, so like imagine a control panel and this control panel has a number of switches. So you can imagine here's like a switch right here and here's a switch right here and each switch switch has a like on position and an off position. So if you're imagining like if we have two different switches here that could be on or off, like how many different combinations can you get the states of this control panel in? And there's really only two, uh, there's four, there's four total, right? They're both on, they're both off, one is on, the other is off, or vice versa. Um, and the on and off here corresponds with true and false. P could be true or false, Q could be true or false. If we want to throw in even more propositional letters, nothing's stopping us. We could have an R in here, and that would be like another switch. And as soon as we do that, if we added another switch here, now we get even more possible combinations for how this control panel could be arranged. The mathematical pattern to this is 2 to the nth power, where n stands for the number of different propositional letters we have. So in the case of just p and q, we have 2 to the second power, which is 2 times 2, which is 4. And lo and behold, here are our four possibilities right here. So we've covered all the possible combinations of what could happen. These are, these are all the starting possible conditions that we need to track for in seeing what happens to this expression, what happens to this expression. Um, so that's where we're going so far here. Uh, Neil, any questions before I go further? No, no questions. Okay, cool. All right, so let's start with um, and, which is, and I'm going to make this font a little smaller here. This is what we call the conjunction. And uh, the you can sort of just think about it informally right now as the English word and. Uh, that's a good paradigmatic example. We're not always going to have nice paradigmatic examples here <laughs> for some of these logical expressions, but we can get close. And is pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of question about under what conditions would this be true and under which conditions would it be false. Um, P and Q saying both of these things are true is only true when both of them are actually true. So in this first case here, we get a true value. 
But in any of these other possibilities where P is true but Q is false, or P is false and Q is true, or they're both false, under those circumstances, to claim P and Q are both true is just not accurate. It's a false statement under any of those conditions. So you can kind of imagine this of like, what if someone uttered this claim? Someone said, you know what I think? I think P and Q are both true. And then we think about like, what are the actual facts in the world? And the world could be set up all sorts of different ways. And if I said P and Q are both true, when in fact, while P is true, Q is false, I'd be saying something false. I'd be depicting the facts in an inaccurate way. So I wouldn't be representing how things actually are. So that's like if I claim there are aliens on Alpha Centauri that like Nicolas Cage movies, and there's no aliens on Alpha Centauri, then boom, that claim is just false, right? Now, if there are aliens on Alpha Centauri that, that like Nicolas Cage movies, then my statement would be true. And I may not know what's going on with the world, but again, I can see under what conditions would it be true and under what conditions it would be false. So the, the real upshot here is that this entire truth table right here, all of these values are what define the meaning of P and Q being a true state, what it, what it just means to make that claim, to say P and Q is true. The truth, the entire table of truth conditions tell you that. And again, logic isn't going to tell you which of these possibilities are the facts in the actual world. It just tells you under what circumstances would this statement be true versus false. Okay, is that feeling good, Neil? That's a really big idea, so I'm, I want to make sure that anyone watching this video is like, okay, okay. And is, are you feeling all right with it? Yeah, I'm feeling good with it. Any possible things that you might be like I'm not exactly sure about? Um, the only thing I'm looking at on the next, it's in the next column, the PRQ. Yes. Is it just basically, if I could take a shot at it, is it, sure. just, is it three... Um, three true statements and one false statement, or the bottom one being false? That is correct. But your intuitions here, while correct in this case, could have easily been wrong. Because when it comes to or, things are a little tricky. So or is, here, what? here we go. Now we're getting into the wedge here. We're talking about disjunction. That's the formal name for this. And this can be understood as the or, but in this case we're saying it's the inclusive or, all right? Um, and that's to distinguish it from the exclusive or, which I'm going to put in the next column over here, although I'm running out of space. Uh, here, let's get rid of, let's erase our whiteboard a little bit. Boom. So this is the inclusive disjunction. We also have an exclusive disjunction. And both of these meanings, the inclusive and exclusive, um, Eng the English language is ambiguous about it. It doesn't tell you what way to, uh, like if I use the English word and, I can't tell you um, whether it's one way or the other just by looking at the basic semantic and syntactic conventions of English. or the English word or is ambiguous between these two logical meanings. Um, and we actually do have a symbol for this in logic. Um, P or Q where we put uh, a little line underneath the wedge like that. But you're not allowed to use this symbol. Uh, we're going to do something different here. Um, logicians are always very cautious about adding new symbols into the logical language because every time we add a new symbol we're gonna have to write up a bunch of other rules that get into other aspects of formal logic that we're not gonna cover in this class but are like the next things you would study after this um, you're, there's basically a set of defined rules for what makes for valid inferences and the the ultimate goal of a logical language is to be able to express or capture all of the valid arguments that exist and not give license to arguments that are actually invalid using those rules. So every time we add a new symbol we have to write up a whole lot more rules uh, to work with in that language and, and logicians want to keep it elegant. So if I can capture this meaning using symbols I've already defined I don't want to invent new symbols for it. Um, 
But let, let's that's that's a sidebar here. Let's get back to the main point, which is that the disjunction comes in two flavors. <clears throat> and the one that you landed on, Neil, your intuitions landed on, is the inclusive one, and that's what the wedge is actually going to stand for. But the exclusive or, well, uh, the inclusive or is saying something like, at least one of these two things is true. That's why it gets a true value if they're both true. Because it's still true to say at least one of these is true if they're both true. But some of you who are watching this on YouTube later might have not had Neil's intuition. And they might, your, your thoughts might have first drifted to an or situation in which it's one or the other but not both. And that's what the exclusive or captures. It's saying there's only one possible thing that could be true here. At least one of them is true, but not both of them. So if both are true, this statement comes out false. It's going to be true here, because at least one of them is true, but not both. And true here, because at least one of them is true, but not both. And it's false here, because you don't have the at least one of them being true. Now, uh, anyone who is sort of already picking up on how this game is going and some of the language that I've been using might have noticed that this expression we have up here captures that meaning right here one or the other at least one of them is true and which is really just the logical meaning of but it's not the case that that's the negation P and Q both are true okay so oops oh don't want to do that here let's get it back over there so this statement here is going to have the same logical meaning as this one right here. So exclusive or, we do have this symbol, but I'm not going to let you use it. Instead, you're going to use this string of symbols to capture the exclusive or. And let me wipe away my whiteboard a little bit more here. So we got some more space to work with. I'm going to use this exclusive or as a way to demonstrate how to calculate truth values for longer expressions. So these two simple ones that we've got here, the ampersand and the wedge, that's really straightforward. We're just going to define those. okay? And we can use our intuitions mostly to figure this out. Um, the next thing, the conditional, we're not going to be able to use our intuitions for because our <laughs> intuitions are very confused about conditionals. Um, but in this case, it's pretty straightforward to fill out the truth tables. But what about for something that's like this, something this messy? Um, that's going to take a little bit more work. And there's a method that the book, if you've read chapter 6 from the book, the book teaches you how to calculate these things. But I actually think the book's method is, surprise, surprise, not the best. Or at least, I mean, it's fine. It's fine. Um, but over the years of teaching, I've been able to uh, improve on it, um, I think. So uh, try out my method, see how that goes for you, and if it doesn't quite work um, or you like the book's method a little bit better, it's okay to use the book's method. The, the main uh, arguments I'd offer here on behalf of my method are the book's method has a tendency to make you more prone for clerical errors, like just little mistakes in how you're writing things out in your calculations that I think my method avoids. And then also, the book's method might give you the misleading uh, impression that these operators themselves get truth values, and they don't. The operators are always, they're like the chemical bonds in the molecule. I just erased it, but remember that metaphor. They're holding together simple propositions or other chunks of things. Um, they don't have any meaning by themselves. If, if you just wrote and all by itself, that would be useless. That's unintelligible. It doesn't express a thought. It's, it's only getting its meaning and how it's combining other things together. Um, and I think my method kind of maps that a little bit better. And then my final argument is that um, the way that my method's going to go, the way you're going to kind of draw out your work, is I think help, it, it maps a little bit closer to what you'd have to do if you're just going to calculate these things in your head, not using scratch paper or anything like that. So you're kind of externally on the paper um, diagramming the kind of thought process, the like mental pathways that you want to train if you're just going to do this in your head. Uh, so for all those reasons, I like my method. If it doesn't work for you, your mileage may vary. 
uh, that's fine. Uh, you don't have to do it my way. Um, the only thing that is needed is that you get the truth table at the end of the day. That's the key thing. But let me walk you through how my process works here for how we figure out whether this whole statement is true or false under certain possible conditions. And uh, it might look scary at first, but it's really not. Uh, I mentioned in the last video that <clears throat> calculating for more complex logical expressions does not require you to be able to hold the meaning sort of intuitively in your head or in your imagination. Um, all you have to do is be able to do simple calculations one at a time in the right order to calculate a larger expression. So let me do a little demonstration to show you how that works. Um, you can imagine when you're doing a truth table here that you actually have to do a whole bunch of problems in order to complete the truth table. So it's like we have question marks here. We know we got to say under these circumstances, this statement is either true or false. Under these circumstances, it's either true or false. Under these circumstances, whoop, it's either true or false. And under these circumstances over here, it's either true or false. So we're going to knock them out one at a time. One uh, situation, one possibility at a time. So let's do the first one up here. What happens when P and Q are both true? Well, I encourage you to get out your scratch paper, write the expression over here, and then kind of do a little wheel of fortune here. Um, P comes out true under these circumstances. Q turns out true. P turns out true again over here. And Q turns out true. And this isn't a calculation. This is just copying it over from the, the conditions over here, the inputs um, in the truth table chart. Okay. Next step. There, there's kind of a core uh, principle to all this. Um, here, one second. Okay, so once we've got the inputs here, so we're targeting one of these at a time. So we're doing we're doing this first value here. You just look over here on the left side of the chart once you've set up all the possibilities and just knock them out one at a time. So under this first set of possibilities, P is true and Q is true. We plug those in and then we basically turn the crank and chug out the answers. And the basic principle that's going to guide all of this, the sort of axiom of truth table calculations, is you're always calculating inside out. So if you see those parentheses kind of chunking up the expression, you always want to work on the inside out. You're not going to be able to cover the whole thing right at the beginning. But given the values we already have, we know the value under these circumstances for P and the value for Q, now we're in a position, using the truth table chart we already have over here, we know how to calculate for just this chunk. And I, this is what I actually do when I'm drawing it out on scratch paper and what I encourage you to do. Draw this little line with the little brackets going up because you can imagine that the brackets are like covering which chunk of the expression we're actually talking about. So right now, this chunk right here is being evaluated. Okay, based on its component parts. And the value we get of the inclusive or, this wedge, under the circumstances that the two chunks are true, then you get a true result. So ab above the line are the inputs, and that turns into this output. So the letter, the truth value you put below the line is in t in, under this system is representing the truth value that just this chunk has. And you ignore the rest of the expression when you're doing this. You don't have to look at it. Um, we're just looking at this part right here and ignoring the rest. And then we're going to do the same thing over here. We're going to work inside out. Now that I know that P is true and Q is true, I can figure out this P and Q chunk. And so let's draw the line like this. And if P and Q are both true, then to say P and Q is to say something true. So there we go. Very important note here. Notice how I didn't touch this negation. It's very tempting to use intuitions that you have from uh, doing math to like distribute the negation through the parentheses. You can't use those algebraic intuitions here. Logic plays by different rules than, than uh, algebra. 
So we want to be careful about that. Um, there is a way to distribute negations in parentheses, but it's not as straightforward as this. Let me let me kind of demonstrate this. Uh, yeah, this is a good tangent. Um, so to say not P and Q is not to say the same thing as not P and not Q. Those have two different meanings. This one on the left hand side is denying that they're both true. On the right hand side it's giving you two pieces of information. It's saying P is false and Q is false. That's really different. This uh, one on the right side gives you far more information than the one on the left side. Um, to just deny that they're both true doesn't mean that they're both false. They could not both be, they could, <laughs> language. To say that P and Q are not both true, that would be compatible with, say, P being true and Q being false. So a situation in which they're not both false. So these don't have the same logical meaning to them. Uh, there is something that they do have this that does have the same logical meaning, and this might be fun to do. This is just sort of bonus stuff. While um, denying P and Q are both true doesn't mean not P and not Q, it does mean that at least one of them is false, which is what this thing says. Either, this is an either or statement, either P is false not true, or Q is false. If we're denying that P and Q are both true, then at least one of them's got to be false. That's what's going on there. Also, if we're saying P and Q are both false, that's actually the same thing as saying it's not the case that at least one of them is true. So you can distribute negations on parentheticals that have and or or, but you have to flip the sign from conjunction to disjunction or disjunction to conjunction. This is called the De Morgan's rule. But it's not something you have to know for our class, um, but this is something you'd learn pretty fast if you took a formal logic class. This is one of those rules I was alluding to earlier as um, defining what kinds of valid inferences we can make. Okay, but let's not worry too much about that. Blope. So we're working here on trying to calculate the value of this expression under these conditions. And we got this piece figured out, we got this piece figured out. Now that we know that this P and Q chunk is true, now we know what to do with this negation. So <clears throat> the truth table for negations is very straightforward. Let me draw it up for you. So a negation is only talking about one propositional letter. Right? So depending on what's happening with P, then we'll, we can figure out what's happening with not P. So P is either true or it's false. And if P is true, when I deny that P is true, I'm saying something false. But if I deny that P is true, when P is in fact false, then I'm saying something true. So really negation is like a light switch. Um, whatever is the thing being negated, whatever truth value the thing being negated has, the negation just flips that value. So if now we're talking about the P and Q chunk as being the thing being negated, once we know what value it has, we know how to handle the negation. So now I'm gonna draw another little line here like that and I'm gonna flip the value from true to false okay so I'm working off of this value right here right I calculated that this whole chunk was true and not something true is something false and you can see the brackets on this line I drew kinda of sloppily <clears throat> the brackets go up to cover this entire not P and Q chunk now so we've got this whole thing captured. We know that chunk under these conditions comes out false. How you doing, Neil? I want to check in again. This is a, a part of the lecture I like to take very slow. I was doing well, I just was, yeah, I was curious when the negation was going to get applied to it. So yeah. is that 
have any effect on the since there's a second false does you drag down the the true on the uh the statement on the left so they don't affect each other directly but what you might be anticipating is that they're going to get combined with this ampersand <clears throat> the and operator the conjunction operator is going to integrate what's happening with these two chunks together all together that's where we're going next okay but i i find students just have a little bit of a a bump in the road a lot of times of moving from calculating values of individual letters with an operator to these more complex chunks but really it's in principle exactly the same thing we can just pretend like this whole thing is the p chunk and this whole part is the q chunk and when one chunk is true and the other chunk is false in an and statement what's the value Neil? Sorry, can you repeat that? Sorry. I'm... In an and statement, <clears throat> if one part of the and statement, one chunk of it is true and the other chunk is false, then what is this, the truth value of the whole and statement? It would be, uh, it would be true? False. Is it, would be, oh, it's not validity. Okay, it's not validity. Okay. No, no, no. We're, we're just talking about how and works. So, so oh. this is good. Um, I'm kind of happy you gave the wrong answer. Um, <laughs> in a weird sort of way. Let's go back to our truth table here for the conjunction. We defined how conjunction operates by looking at under what inputs does it spit out which output. So here we've got a P chunk and a Q chunk. When the P part's true and the Q part's false, we get the second row right here. And that's a case where it's false. Okay. That case is what you're seeing up here. The first part's true, the second part's false, so that's going to be a false statement. How's that feeling? It's feeling better. It's just, yeah, this is kind of definitely a bit, you know, tracking the logic. It's a bit uh, definitely new and, and uh, kind of abstract. Yes. And... <clears throat> this this uh, this skill it's it's kind of like a visualization skill when you're looking at a logical expression to be able to uh, chunk it in your mind right to be able to see parts of the expression as pieces um, I like what I'm doing here with this kind of animation where I take this box right here's a chunk right here's a chunk too it just happens to be the whole expression taken together but you got a you got a little chunk there. You've got a chunk here, this P and Q thing. You also have a chunk here, and that's what all of my little lines that I've been drawing underneath here are representing. That's why the little bracket tails on them are so important, that they are telling you what part of the expression they're evaluating for. And the the whole rule of how logic works here is if you want to see what's going on with complex statements, you need to see what's going on with their component parts. And those component parts could be simple letters or they could be um, bigger things. Actually, you know, I've got a way I can draw this. I could have made the truth tables down here different. Instead of using P and Q, I could have done this. Let's do it. Let's do it like this. So we got true, false, true, oh, well, uh, let's not do it that way. True, true, false, false, oh, microphone. And then over here, we've got true, false, true, false. That looks exactly the same like the conditions we set up over here, right? But now instead of P's and Q's, let's just do triangle, and box like that so I could do box and actually there is a there is a triangle shape here isn't there and triangle there we go and I could fill out the truth table here and it would look like the truth table we had for and before 
like that. So what could go in these boxes? Well, conceivably anything. It could be P is the triangle and Q is the box, or it could be something like the whole P or Q chunk is the triangle chunk, right? You could have that in there. Um, here, I, I'll, I'm gonna mess, make a mess of this, but here you got like, there's one, and then the box could be the whole other part right here, like that. So now if I'm trying to figure out what is the expression, for, what is the truth value for this entire expression, once I know these parts here, I can basically ignore all the rest of this stuff that's going on behind the scenes, right? I know the triangle chunk is true and the box part is false. So what happens with the and statement? It's false. Did that help? Yeah, that does help. So so we're going on the second. So it's just you're including the, the negation sign. I guess that was the second, the false statement. Why, why it was false? Because that it can't be. They can't be true. They can't be both of them. Correct? With the negation on the second, or the the f below the, the true value. So this negation thing is working on the same principle of what I was talking about, the triangles and the boxes. So uh, here, I, let me draw it out again like this. Um, and I'm going to give myself a space here. P and Q. So if we're just isolating this part of the expression, just looking at it down here, um, think about this. Ugh. That's yes, a little bit. P the P and Q thing is like the triangle with a negation in front of it. So if I've got triangle here, not triangle, right? I get the result for how the negation operates. So if the triangle part is coming out true, which is what we had right here, then not triangle comes out false. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So once you get the truth value that covers the entire expression, so the one down here that the brackets encompass the whole thing, the value that you have here is the value that you plop here into into uh, the truth table. So we calculated that under the conditions that P is true and Q is true, saying this whole blah is saying something false. And the next thing we need to do is just calculate it for the next one. So what happens there? So I'm going to erase all my scratch paper work. P is still true here, but Q is now false. So I need to replace those with false values. There we go. And then we do the same thing we just did. We work inside out. So Neil, I, how about I, I lean on you a little bit here. I'll walk you through which brackets we're going to be evaluating for and you tell me what the answer is. So Sounds good. we can do this P or Q chunk. What's that going to turn out as? True. That's right, because at least one of them is true. That's how OR works. That's how the wedge operates. Okay, now we've got the P and Q chunk over here, where P is true and Q is false. How that's going to come out? It's going to come out as false. Yep, because they're not both true. That's how AND works. Now that we know that's going on, we can slip in the NOT blah, and we're going to get... A true statement. Yep. The negation just operates like flipping a light switch. The false value here flips to true. And now that we've got this whole chunk figured out and this whole chunk figured out, we're in a position to evaluate how that AND is combining them. And we get... We get a uh, true statement. Yep, because this piece is true and this piece is true. And that's what the sentence is saying saying this whole thing is true and this is true and lo and behold that's what's happening so that's a true statement and so that value is the value that we're gonna throw down here in the truth table and also just want to point out notice how that's faring with our other way of expressing an exclusive disjunction so far the truth values are lining up exactly the way we want them to um, 
because the meaning of a logical expression is defined by its truth conditions, here's the next big idea theoretically from the lecture today. If two expressions have the same uh, truth tables, they have the same meaning. And if they have the same meaning, then they're going to have the same truth table. We'll, we'll, work, we'll bring back that idea later on in the lecture. Okay. Um, do, were, you, were you about to say something, Neil? No, I wasn't going to say anything. I'll just wait until we, until we move down to the next uh, row. Okay. Yeah, let's just bang these out so you can see it demonstrated more and, and get a little bit more practice. Um, you're sort of learning as you work on these how each of these operators sort of works. And maybe at the beginning you have to consult this chart, which I like to call this kind of skeleton key for logic. Um, but after doing this enough times, you're going to get sick of looking at the reference sheet and you'll just have internalized it. And that's exactly where you want to be. You want to be at a point here. That's why I was saying in the last lecture, like practice is very important for formal logic. Uh, do a few truth table problems a day, um, and pretty soon this will become second nature, and you won't have to think about it so much. Um, and if that's not happening, call me up, <laughs> and let's try to diagnose what is happening. Um, okay, so now we're evaluating for the third row, where P is false and Q is true. So P false, Q true, P is false, Q is true. All right, so we're going to have a chunk here and a chunk here. All right, what's this chunk over here, Neil? True. Yep, because at least one of them is true. How about this one? That one is going to be a uh, false statement. Yep, because they're not both true. And then we'll grab the negation, factor that in. That's a true Yep, statement. just just flips it. And that means the whole thing is going to be true. Yep, because the two parts are true. All right. So we got a true value there. And now we've got one more, one final case. And this is the case in which P and Q are both false. get rid of those Q ones and put in falses and really if you're feeling uh, if any students here are feeling like I can do this in my head I see what's going on I still recommend doing this long form with the scratch paper at least at the beginning um, to get that practice to get comfortable with it I really do think this still is there, Tim? yeah can you hear me hello Did I lose you, Neil? Oh, sorry, we had some technical difficulties. Um, and I l forgot what I was saying <laughs> well, when it all got interrupted. Um, I think we were calculating for this last value here. Um, do you, what, what do you remember the last thing I was, I was saying, Neil? Okay. I think I was, I have a memory, I was saying something like, even if uh, you feel like you can do this in your head, it's still good to do the practice. Yeah, I, I talked about all that, I think. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Let's just keep going and, and we'll finish this off. Um, okay, so what happens here, Neil? That's right. Not at least one of them is true. And then how about over here? That's false because they're not both true. They're both false, actually. And then we've got the negation. Sorry, my mouse. I'm not very adept with it. What do we got here? Well, yeah, yeah. False was the this chunk, and then the negation flips it to true. And now, 
we can figure out the whole thing. And that would be false. That's right, because the two chunks are not both true. So false is the value we're going to be putting down there in the truth table. And lo and behold, they're the exact same truth table. These two columns that we have set up here, they have all the same truth values under the same circumstances. So that means these really are logically the same. They have the same meaning to them. Um, so we can use them interchangeably. We don't need to uh, invoke this new symbol of the wedge with the underline. We can be, we can say no to that. Nope, don't need it because this expression does all the work we need it to. Um, just using the symbols we already have. Conjunction, disjunction, and over here, negation. The not. All right. Now we still have a couple other logical operators to talk about. Conditionals and biconditionals. Um, and that's what we'll talk about next. Um, I want to take a little break in the middle of the lecture because we're coming up about on an hour. Um, so I think we should do that. Um, and then I'll come back finish up conditionals and biconditionals, and then we'll talk a little bit about translations. Um, Neil, any questions you have uh, before we take a break? All right, cool. I'll see you in a little bit. Okay, so um, I'm actually going to call a little audible here. I mentioned that I wanted to go through all the logic stuff first, and then we can start talking about translations. And I'm actually going to jump the gun slightly on that. I'm going to try to integrate these a little bit more. Because at this point, you basically can see how the logical system, the logical symbol language works in principle. Um, we still have a couple other operators to define by giving them truth tables. But you've seen what truth tables are, what information they're representing, and how we can use them to calculate truth tables for more complicated things like we did with this expression here. Um, so the rest of it would just be more of the same, right? But because we're talking about this inclusive, exclusive, or business, that allows me to um, bring up this theme of, of some of the complications that are going to come from translating things from English into formal logic. So we can talk about the principles of what's going on here with the translation step of analysis. Um, First thing that we already know from talking about or here is that English is ambiguous. It's not technically precise in the way that formal logic is. Um, and we've, we've had plenty of demonstrations of this so far in the quarter, uh, all the way from the very beginning of the quarter with the Chapter 2 material. We know that we communicate information not just explicitly but also implicitly. And that sometimes those implicit meanings are fuzzy. Um, a lot of stuff in English can be unclear or not perfectly well defined. It can be ambiguous. It can be vague. Um, and logic doesn't have those attributes to it. But we also have a theme that's going to be relevant here um, from when we are putting arguments into standard form. Uh, we Again, we're wrestling with English and trying to figure out like what are the ideas that a person is using to build an argument and what's the structure of that argument and all that good stuff. And while we were doing the standard form and diagramming as a way to capture that information um, in a more formal way than just argumentative prose, there were a lot of things that we would leave out. Remember that the standard form and diagram was only supposed to be capturing the uh, argumentative content of what someone is saying. And there could be a lot of other things going on than just the argument that someone is offering. Arguing is not the only speech act someone may be performing. They could be performing other actions, too, and have other purposes, other conversational acts in mind, other than just trying to defend a certain conclusion as being rationally justified. That kind of theme is going to show up here. There's a lot of information that logic doesn't have the power to capture. All it's really capturing is this truth-functional stuff. The way in which um, the truth of what we're saying or the meaning of it depends on how the meaning of its component parts are arranged. 
So understanding these kind of formal constructions of our thoughts or propositions or beliefs is all that we're really capturing. It's just stuff related to truth. Everything else is, you know, not um, represented in this way of drawing a portrait of the argument. And that's important to remember here. Um, not everything is going to get in there. Just some things. And we're we're just we're just talking about the things that matter for logical inference, ultimately validity. That's it. So just the truth conditions of statements and how those truth conditions interlock with each other. That's what we're covering. So when you're listening to things in English, you're getting this you're getting information. We can convey information. We make claims in English or other um, other uh, natural languages. And what we're trying to do in the translation is capture the information that's being offered uh, in that natural language. We want to capture that same information. We want to be able to express that same information using the logical symbol language. So we can go through these one by one. When it comes to this logical operator of the conjunction, what that is, what form of a claim is being captured there is when someone is giving you two pieces of information. They're saying this is true, and also this is true. You're getting you're getting two things together. When I make an, a disjunctive statement in logic, this is representing someone claiming that there are multiple possibilities. This or this could happen, and we can get more technical between inclusive and exclusive here. But there isn't going to be this kind of straightforward one-to-one -one mechanical way to go about doing these translations just the same as there was not a straightforward one-to-one -one turn the crank way of doing annotations for argumentative prose or putting things into standard form and diagramming them there's a little there's a lot of listening that has to happen here and in some cases creative judgment calls for how to capture this the best now I'm not gonna throw super wacky stuff at you on the exam on exam two when it covers this material um, but I, I will be giving you some things that are a little bit more straightforward um, but there are still some things to be savvy to certain possible uh, traps or uh, difficulties with English that we want to have on the radar when we're trying to make this translation happen um, each of the operators has its own sort of like sticky wicket with conjunction, it has to do with this, what the book calls the distinction between propositional and non-propositional conjunctions. So it's possible here for there to be a English sentence that uses the word and, but should not be translated using the ampersand. And let me give you an example. So take this sentence. Ugh. Tim and Ludwig played chess. So there's an and in there. And you might think, hey, we can translate this as T and L. Why not? Right? And again, we need to define what the simple propositions are. T might be Tim played chess. L might be Ludwig played chess. Did we capture all the information? Yeah, looks like it, right? Well, wait a second. Not so fast. Because if we're, we're presenting it this way in logic, then we're saying there are these two independent pieces of information. Over here, Tim played chess. That happened. That's true. And completely separately, Ludwig played chess. But if we hear this sentence in English, if you hear Tim and Ludwig played chess, you're probably just not getting the information, not merely the information, oh, it's a true fact that Tim played chess today. And it's also an independently true fact that Ludwig played chess today. Instead, this is probably going to give off the meaning, again, through maybe some implication, that Tim and Ludwig played chess together. Right? And that information is lost in this translation right here. Just having it as Tim played chess separately, Ludwig played chess, loses that, that bit of information, that they played chess with each other. Right? Um, so actually, we just have to translate this as C. This is a case of a non-propositional conjunction. A use of and 
that isn't representing a propositional structure to it. Um, so we would just have one simple proposition here. Tim and Ludwig played chess together. That's it. Nothing more to do. There's no structure to unpack here using the logical symbols. But other cases of and absolutely are propositional conjunctions like um, Woo. Let's see. Tim and Ludwig um, Oh man, now I'm trying to come up with something on the spot. Hmm. Oh no, that put, we have that conversational implication too. Here we go. Tim and Ludwig attended class. Now this is not something that is non-propositional, that it's important that they were both in the same class or something like that. It probably isn't giving off that information as uh, under implication. It can really be like Tim attended class today and Ludwig attended class today. And that, so that should be translated like that. So this first one would be a use of and that is non-propositional. Here, let's make this explicit. This one is a non-propositional conjunction. And this one here is a propositional conjunction. I did the same thing. Okay, so those are two different examples. And there's really no, um, there's not a grammatical clue to this or anything like that. You just have to put on your listening ears and be like, okay, what's the information I'm being given? Am I being given two pieces of information or am I being given one piece of information? And that's how you will make the judgment call between which translation to do here. That's all there really is to say about conjunction. I, I, there's not too much more here that I'm going to be telling you to be explicitly tracking um, or concerned about or worried about. Um, so that we can move on here. So that's what's going on with conjunction. That's the kind of trap to watch out for. Here, I'm going to... Let's make some more room here on the whiteboard. Um, when it comes to or, we've already talked about the issue, that English or is ambiguous between inclusive and exclusive. So uh, what you really need to ask yourself, and actually I'm going to, uh, sorry, let me erase this. Let's take out this inclusive, exclusive bit right here. If you've got an English sentence, so whatever is the English here, the English sentence, and you can see that it has or language, maybe that's either or, something or something else, or the word unless, we'll have to talk about unless here. Um, all of those words in English let you know there's a range of possibilities. Um, but you're not sure, should this be treated inclusively or is this exclusive? Right? What, what is, which one is it? Here's the exclusive one. Here's the inclusive one. The best way to decide what form needs to, your translation needs to take, oops, knock something over. Um, best way to figure that out is to ask yourself, just is do you think the English sentence is true or false under the situation in which both parts of that or both possibilities actually occur if you think the English sentence is true under this circumstance then use the inclusive disjunction so that it's matching that truth table if you think it's false then use the exclusive way to handle it and let's do some examples so you can see this and, and we're gonna kill two birds with one stone here because I'm gonna talk about unless here in the process so take this sentence. Um, I think this one was from the book. The logs will make a nice campfire unless they are wet. So what I like about this is it's just so straightforward. So you've got an unless 
and that should read to you that there's an or statement occurring. And the two sides of the of the um, unless statement are this first one, this simple proposition, the logs make a nice campfire. Let's call that uh, N. Logs make a nice campfire. The logs are wet. That's the, the other possibility here. The logs are wet. So what is this supposed to look like? We could translate it like this. N or W. You could do it like that. Or we could translate it as N or W and not N and W. Which way is right? Well, let's see what happens when N and W both happen. See what you think of the English sentence here, uh, whether you think the English sentence would be true or false, to make the decision here about what logical translation to use. So I tell you, let's say we're going camping, and I'm like, these logs will make a nice campfire unless they're wet. And I, I don't know, we don't know what's going on with the logs yet, but we see some logs and we're like, let's say we, we show up at the cabin that we're renting or something like that, and we see a bunch of logs, and I can tell what kind of wood it is or something like that, and so I make the claim, these logs will make a nice campfire unless they are wet. Well, what happens to the truth of that statement? Are you going to think I'm saying something true or false if we make a campfire out of them, and it's a nice campfire, so that's true, and it's also true that they were wet? Would you say I said something true or false? What do you think, Neil? Can you hear me? Neil? Oh. Oh. No worries. Did you catch what I was saying? Do you think that's a true or false statement under the circumstances that the logs are wet and they turn out to make a nice campfire? Yeah, yeah, that's what I hear too. Um, if you heard something different, let's talk about it. Uh, anyone watching this on YouTube later? Um, but yeah, we hear that as false. Um, that's kind of the scenario I'm saying can't happen, right? If the logs are wet, they're not going to make a nice campfire. You can't have both those things together. I'm ruling out the possibility of both. And so that's what we need to do here in our translation as well. Remember the little phrase I, I told you in the last video for this? Uh, exclusive disjunction one or the other but not both right it's got that meaning to it um, and you can read it that way one or the other and but not both of them so if the English sentence would come out false if both things happen then you're gonna have to use the exclusive formula as a way to translate that so that's one one case of unless that goes in that direction Let's look at another example. And we're going to have different translations here. Take this. This is also from the book. Oop. You won't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. Again, we've got uh, one simple thing on one side and another simple thing on the other side, although it's a little more complicated this way. And actually, we'll, we'll handle that. Man, my mouse work is so bad. I can do better than this. So we have this unless. Unless is just or. On one side, we have you won't win the lottery. Now that's actually not a simple proposition. That's a complex proposition because it's denying something. And we want to capture that in logic. We always want to capture as much as we can. So we've got not, you don't win. They're denying uh, you won't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. Now that's simple. That's just, let's just call that B. 
for you buy a ticket. So then we're looking at a situation where on the inclusive side, if it was going to be translated inclusively, we would have not W or B. Those are the two possibilities. Again, it could be more complex. It could be a bigger chunk that this is holding together. That's on one side. On the other side, though, if we're going to follow this exclusion, uh, exclusive pattern, here B is just like the Q part, but the P part is not W. So we need to put not W every time that P part would show up. So we would have not W or B and not, again, not W and B. Uh, see how that works? Think back to like the uh, triangle square thing, right? There's one piece and it needs to show up exactly the same every time it shows up the same here. Same thing with the Q piece. So if we've got not W here, it's going to go there and there, right? So these are the two translations. Um, if it was going to be exclusive, it would look like this. If it was going to be inclusive, it would look like this. So, Neil, I'm going to ask you again. Uh, this sentence, you won't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. Is that statement true or false under the circumstances where both of these things happen? Namely, you buy a ticket and you don't win. Yeah, it is a true statement. I could like we could imagine this dramatically like I tell you, hey, you won't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket, and then you go off and buy a ticket and you lose, and you come back to me and you're like, hey, I bought a ticket and I didn't win, and I said, I didn't tell you that if you buy a ticket you will win, I just said that you you definitely won't win if you don't buy a ticket, right? So uh, this one is true. So you would use the inclusive translation to capture that. Now the big point about like doing these examples is that you'll notice there's really nothing grammatical here that makes them different from each other. I mean the fact that this one's talking about how you won't win, that doesn't really change it here. Um, you always have to think through the situation you, yourself with your listening ears. Um, there's not some trick here that you can find the smoking gun for inclusive versus exclusive. English just doesn't have that built in to its system of semantic and syntactic conventions. So you just have to think like, do I think the speaker uh, would, uh, if the speaker made this claim, would that claim be true or false under the circumstances that both of the possibilities end up happening? And that's going to be the dividing line. That's the only case that really separates these two truth tables, right? All the other truth table, all, all the other possibilities, they match on their truth values. So this is really the acid test for whether it goes one way or the other. Um, there's something else I wanted to say here. Um, oh, shoot, I'm losing it. Oh, right, okay. Sometimes when you're trying to listen to what's going on here, it might seem really genuinely ambiguous. There's not like some context set up. Like, like uh, I always like to joke around like this way. If you go to a fancy restaurant and the waiter says, you can have the soup or the salad. Um, you're probably interpreting that as exclusive, one or the other, but not both. If you go to Red Robin uh, and they're like super salad, you're like both, and they'll be like, you got it, <laughs> right? Like something that's not a classy joint. The, the conventions, the rules are different, and so that sets a context that influences how the, the same utterance by the waiter can carry a different connotation of information. Um, but sometimes, so because it's so dependent on things like implication, there can be some cases of genuine ambiguity here. In which case, I encourage and advise you to go with the inclusive statement as the translation instead of the exclusive. You really want to save the exclusive translation to a case where the speaker is clearly ruling out the possibility of both. Okay? If it's at all ambiguous, you should go on the side of inclusive here. And there's a reason for this. The inclusive uh, logical form actually gives less information than the exclusive one. And I, I'm going to explain this in a second, but right now what can just make sense is that uh, if you look at a truth table for an expression, the more false values there are, the more information you're getting. 
the more informative it is. Uh, I can illustrate this. Well, okay, before I do the illustration, though. Um, so because the exclusive disjunction here has two false values in its truth table, where the inclusive only has one, the exclusive is more informative. So if I'm trying to decide how to interpret what someone's saying, just like when we were talking about doing standard form, um, just like when we were talking about um, uh, handling um, implied meanings of any kind, like chapter two stuff, we're always sensitive about putting words into people's mouths that they don't necessarily mean, right? Where we're just projecting our meaning onto them. And interpretation requires, you know, a little bit of willingness to do this, but we always want it to be justified based on how someone actually talked or how they actually behaved in the conversation. There needs to be something provoking that. Like in the case of Paul Grice's theory of conversational implication, there has to be a Grice and Maxim violation before we start looking for implied meanings. So um, there's always the danger of putting words in people's mouths that they don't really mean. So if I'm really not sure, if it's ambiguous, I'm going to be careful about that. I will be conservative about attributing a meaning to them that may not be what they mean. The exclusive or, you'll notice, has the inclusive or as a part of it. It's giving that information and more information. right? It's an and statement, two pieces of information. So it's saying more than the inclusive one is. So if it's on the fence, prefer this one. That's the advice. Um, here, you can give it a star. There you go. Inclusive gets the nudge if it's close. Okay, now I can demonstrate this in a much cooler, more robust way as well. Let's see here. Let me draw another picture for you. You remember this picture? Remember that circle represents all the possible ways the world could be. Every single logical possibility. And we can divide it into worlds in which P is true and worlds in which P is false. And we can also divide it into worlds in which Q is true and worlds in which Q is false. And these four quadrants cover the four possibilities we have here in the truth table. Think about um, a truth table giving a false value as basically ruling out where we would find the actual world. Remember, we, we don't know exactly where the world is, but as we learn certain information, we're sort of narrowing it down. If you're playing a logical deduction game like Clue, at the beginning of the game, you're like, well, it could be anything. Anyone could be the murderer. And then you receive your cards and you're like, okay, not these people. And then as the game progresses, you find other information of what is not in the envelope. And that tells you more about what might be in the envelope, right? So you're narrowing down until you finally figure out the full facts, right? That's kind of how what we're doing when we're doing science. We're slowly learning more things about our world and locating it in this possible world space. Like, where would the actual world be found? So if I tell you P and Q, I'm ruling out all of these sectors right here. All of these have been ruled out. Actually, I can do this a little bit better uh, on paint. Boom, boom, boom. We've ruled out all three of those options. When I tell you P or Q is true, inclusive, I'm just ruling out this case. And if I tell you exclusive, I'm ruling out that case and that case. So that's more information. Um, and you can kind of feel this intuitively, right? And if I say P and Q, you're like, that's much more definitive than if I just told you P or Q. At least one of them is true. Right? Is that working for you, Neil? Is this making sense? Awesome. Okay, so when it comes to translating disjunctions, uses of or, uses of unless, you always know it's going to have the core component of P wedge Q. The only question is do you need to tack on this but not both part? And we've talked about the methods for doing so. One final tip I've got. Um, this happens every time I teach this class. I always have some students who want to translate unless statements using conditionals if this then that so like um, let's take uh, the logs will make a nice campfire unless it's wet that that example again here well, let's 
just get it out here on the whiteboard. Let me put it down again. So the logs will make a nice campfire unless they are wet. And we said that this thing should be translated exclusively. So that means we thought it should be translated as camp, uh, nice campfire or wet logs and not the case that you have a nice campfire and you have wet logs at the same time. Now some students want to go this way with it and say, oh, I get what the, the information that the sentence is giving me is that if the logs are wet, then you don't, you're not going to have a nice campfire. All right, so it would look like this. All right? This does not camp capture all the information. Or maybe they might do it like this. If the logs uh, are not wet, then we'll have a nice campfire. All right? Both of these statements, these if-then statements, and we're, we're about to talk about conditionals next, but uh, both of these if-then statements are capturing part of the information of what's going on here, but not all of it. Um, actually, it's kind of funny here. Let me show you something. This is a little bit of higher level formal logic. Uh, if you took uh, the Philosophy 120 class, the formal logic class, you'd learn how to do all this stuff. Um, but from if w then not n, I'm able to derive not w or not n. Those actually mean the same thing. And that's why conditionals can be tempting as a way to handle disjunction. Um, likewise, over here, this would turn into not not w or n. And then this statement here, not w or not n, can we could use the De Morgan's rule that you actually saw earlier to turn it into this. And this part over here, you can take out that double negation because two negatives make a positive in logic. Not in ethics, but in logic. <laughs> and you get this. So if you put two of these, these two pieces of information together, that's what you got here, right? W or N, N or W, and not N and W, not W and N. I mean, flipping N and W, the order doesn't matter here. But these together give you the full information. But either one of these conditionals would have only been half the information in the proper translation. So conditionals are tricky. You still have to handle this exclusive inclusive question. The conditional doesn't settle that, but it's capturing maybe part of the information. So is there a way to do this with conditionals and get proper translations? Absolutely. Yes, that is logically possible. The system can handle that. However, it can be very confusing to do that in that way. There's a lot more questions you have to ask yourself, and it's not quite so intuitive how to go about answering those questions if you're working with conditionals. That's why my advice is just stick with the wedge. The wedge is going to work so much better. You know that it's at least this, and you just have to ask, do I have to rule out the possibility of both? That's it. Okay, did that advice make sense to you, Neil? I think so. And um, that that being said, if on the exam you turned in something like uh, this, where you combine them together with a, with an ampersand, I'd be like, well, that's that's technically correct. <laughs> I'm not going to take off points for you. Um, I just think if you want to give yourself the the best chance of doing this accurately and correctly, to use this method of Figure out whether the English statement would be true or false under the conditions that both parts are true, and then use these inclusive or exclusive expressions as a way to handle it. Okay, speaking of conditionals, we still have to talk about conditionals. So I'm going to do some erasing of the my whiteboard here so that we've got some more space to work with. Conditionals are tricky. I've mentioned before in passing that conditionals, um, they, uh, well, how can I put this nicely? 
we're not great when it comes to conditionals intuitively. We um, we mess them up very very frequently, and um, so we have to be a little cautious with how we go about translating them into formal logic. And I have a huge apology I need to say right off the bat. Whoa. Didn't mean to do that. Okay, we don't need all this. Just making some room here. I'm going to get rid of that star. Uh, I have a huge apology to make right off the bat because what you're going to get in this class is kind of a lie. A useful lie, but, a, but still a lie and an accuracy. We're going to simplify things a little bit to make it easier to manage um, rather than doing conditionals in the most full proper treatment that they would deserve in terms of logical analysis. Um, the, the unfortunate fact is that there are a lot of different types of conditionals. What we're going to be studying is something called the material conditional, but you also have the indicative conditional, you have counterfactual conditionals, uh, you get all sorts of wacky stuff. Um, and here, sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once. One second. Okay, there we go. All right, Tim, draw a really nice horseshoe here. There we go. And then we're going to go, whoa, nope. There, triple bar. Okay. Um, so there's all these different types of conditionals, and the jury is out. I mean, logicians and philosophers don't agree um, about how to really understand the inf informative content of conditionals, whether they're expressed in um, natural languages or in formal systems. Um, I mean, the different forms are pretty well understood. Like, no one's really confused about the material conditional at this point. I mean, it's very well defined. We're going to define it in a second here. Um, but what makes other conditionals different from it? There clearly are conditionals that are different from it. I might do a quick demonstration of that for you in the lecture here. Um, but there's a... It's just, it's just weird. It's just weird. Um, and we don't, we don't have a, a consensus about how to sort out all the ambiguity. Um, I was reading a whole book. Uh, a couple years ago, just just called conditionals, and the whole book is just what to do about all these different conditionals and different attempts people have offered, and their advantages and disadvantages, why they are plausible as a way to explicate the, these meanings, and other cases in which they are implausible. There's a lot of philosophy of language that's going on that gets pretty hairy pretty fast. We don't want to deal with all that. That wouldn't be fair to you. It wouldn't be a nice thing for me to do to give you all that. So we're going to just go with the most basic, straightforward form of the conditional, which is still pretty gosh darn useful. Um, these other conditionals are very interesting, but even if, if all you're getting here in this class is the material conditional, uh, it's still really useful. Um, there's still a lot that we're able to do with that, um, even though it's not everything. It's not exhaustive. It's not an exhaustive analysis here. Um, so let me label these up. Whoa, let's make that smaller. So this is the conditional. And we're going to make a little note here, the material conditional. And then over here we have the biconditional. Oops. The biconditional. So I say this just as a little caveat that if you go on and take other logic classes, not all conditionals are going to work this way. Um, and I just don't want to give you that misinformation. Um, the other thing that, that we're going to talk about early on here, though, is why why does the even the material conditional might seem a little counterintuitive to you initially. Um, 
it's not so much the first value that's weird or the second value, but it's these bottom values that's strange. And let's use a toy case to kind of cash this out. Okay, so um, say um, now this statement is definitely false in my in, in this class. So uh, forgive me for that. This is uh, just a, a statement that could be made. Is it true or false? Again, logic doesn't tell you, but. Um, here's a statement. If you do your homework, you'll pass the class. Not true. Not true. So don't be misled by this example. But it's a really useful little example we could use. So this is saying, if you do your homework, you'll pass the class. And we get, we're going to put a little horseshoe in there. There we go. So H stands for you do your homework. P stands for you pass the class. Um, so what do you think, uh, Neil? I'll use you again if you don't mind. Uh, and if you're if you're in an awkward spot, you know, feel free to, to not answer, and I'll just talk through it. But if let's say both of those two things happened, right? The P part and the Q part, the H and P here. Um, if you do your homework and pass the class, would you think this statement was a true statement? You would be right. That seems pretty intuitive and straightforward, and there's really no complaint about that. What about if the first part happens and the second part doesn't happen? So you do all your homework and you don't pass the class. If those were the circumstances, would this be a true or false statement? Yeah, that's right. And again, no real complaints from our intuitions here. The whole idea of me saying if you do your homework, you'll pass the class, is to deny the situation in which you do your homework and don't pass. Which is why I'm being very careful to tell you the statement is false, because it is very possible in this class to do your homework and not pass the class. That can happen. Um, I don't grade the homework other than that you did it. So, and that's not enough credit uh, to pass all by itself. If you never attended any of the lectures, uh, if you didn't do any of the exams, you're, you're not passing the class. That's not going to happen. Um, or even pass the exam. The, the, it's very possible to basically not be putting in much into the class, but you did all your homework and you can't pass the exam or you, you fail at the exam. That's very, those are very real possibilities in the actual world for our actual class. But when it comes to this sort of scenario, you know, if... If uh, someone did say this, if someone was making this kind of promise to you, you might be skeptical about it because you might think this possibility is very possible. It cannot be ruled out the way that this statement logically is ruling it out. You know, it's saying, yeah, that can't happen. Real world won't be found here. Trust me. Okay? So the question is not so much about how to fill out the first half of the truth table, but what to do about this stuff. And it fits really nicely with um, what we were just saying here, because uh, with, with this example, if you do your homework, you'll pass the class. I mean, what would you say about whether that statement was true or false under the circumstance that a student doesn't do their homework and passes the class? Do you think it's false then? What about if they don't do the homework and they don't pass? Okay, so if you're saying false value here and true value here, you're actually getting at the truth table for the biconditional. And Neil, you are a treasure. I love having you in the class. Thank you. Because you're illustrating one of the core intuitions of, that we have of how we get conditionals wrong. Uh, a very common thing that we do is we treat conditionals as if they are biconditionals. Um, what it, let me define the biconditional since we're talking about it. So a biconditional, this uh, P biconditional Q, really just means if P, if P then Q, and if Q 
then P. The, the regular old conditional is a one-way street. And to illustrate that, let's use another example I've used before in the class. Um, if you cut off my head, I'll die, right? That's true? That doesn't mean that if I'm dead, my head's been cut off. Right? If you flip that conditional around, it has a totally different meaning. But the biconditional is saying that's a two-way street. Right? It's saying, yeah, P and Q mutually entail each other. They only come together. They're only found together. Uh, you never get one without the other. And so that's why it has this kind of truth table here. As long as P and Q have the same value, both true, both false, the statement, the biconditional statement is true. If you get one without the other, that's what it's saying can't happen. Those are the false values. But a conditional is not a biconditional. They're not the same. They're going to have a different truth table um, to capture that. So, um, so what? Let's go back to the drawing board here. Back to the homework, passing the class sort of situation. If the student doesn't do their, I offer this guarantee. I'm like, hey, my class is easy. This isn't my class, but imagine some fictional class. Uh, I'm like, this class is easy. You know, all you got to do is do your homework. You're going to pass. Okay. And then a student doesn't do their homework. Then it's like all bets are off. My guarantee only applied to cases in which the student does their homework, right? Where the first part's true, not when the first part's false. I'm, I'm not really saying anything about that, right? If I tell you if my head is cut off, then I'll die, I'm only talking about what happens when my head is cut off, not about what happens in circumstances where my head has not been cut off. I'm sort of non-committal about that. I'm not... I'm not uh, coming down hard on one, and I'm not trying to say anything about those cases. And that's why we get weird intuitions here. Every time I teach this class in person and I ask students, I'm like, what do you think here? I always have half the class saying true, half the class saying false. Um, so that's a good evidence here of, uh, of how tricky our intuitions are when it comes to conditionals. Let me give you a couple arguments for why there cannot be false values here. So we just talked about the combination that you had in mind, uh, Neil, where the this one was false and then it was true. That makes it like the biconditional. Another thing we um, students sometimes tell me is they think these are false values. Do you notice anything problematic about that, Neil? Does that pattern look familiar? This truth table is the same truth table as another one of our operators. It's the and, and right? T -F, -F, F T F F F. Remember what we said earlier? We said that if two logical expressions have the same truth tables, they have the same meaning because the meaning of a logical expression comes from its truth table. So this would, if we gave it this translation, if we defined the, the material conditional this way, we're saying that making statements of the form if P then Q is the same thing as saying P and Q. And that's absurd. When I tell you if my head is cut off, then I will die, is not to say my head is cut off and I'm dead. Right? This also goes back to when I was drawing that circle of all the possible worlds. I'm not going to do it again right now how the information of a statement comes from the really the cases it's denying the cases that it's saying the actual world will not be found so if the uh, if the conditional is really not trying to say anything about what happens when the first part doesn't happen when it's false like when I tell you if you do your homework you'll pass the class I'm not trying to say anything about what happens if you don't do your homework that's why we're gonna put true values here Basically, putting true values here tells us that the truth of if P then Q is compatible with these scenarios in which P is false and Q is false, or P is false and Q is true. It's compatible with that. These cases wouldn't disprove the statement if P then Q. So no matter how many students never do their homework, that would not pose any threat or present evidence against the claim 
that if you do your homework, you'll pass the class. So that's a little bit about conditionals and, um, and how they work as a truth table. There's some other really important thing to point out about them. So important, I'm going to give them a going to give them a star here. The unlike every other operator that we have, the conditional, the material conditional, is asymmetrical. It's asymmetrical. If p then q, like we were saying earlier, is not the same thing as if q then p. If you had p and q, that's the same thing as q and p. They're going to have the exact, it doesn't matter which one comes first and which one comes later. You're going to get the same truth table. In all the cases where P and Q get different values, you got the same result here. Same thing for disjunction. Same result. Right? With biconditional, same result. It's only in the material conditional that they have different values. So that's why we actually use some technical language here to refer to the different parts of conditionals. Um, the first part of a conditional we call the antecedent and the second part we call the consequent. That terminology is very helpful. The antecedent and the consequent. We have to give them different names because which one comes first and which one comes second is really important. With conjunctions we call the pieces of conjunctions conjuncts and we don't care which one's which in disjunctions we call them disjuncts we don't care but with material conditionals it, it very much matters because the truth table is asymmetrical so translating these suckers is a problem <laughs> the big question I mean you might be able to catch that a sentence in English has this kind of meaning of a hypothetical relationship between states of affairs that's what conditionals are capturing these hypothetical meanings um, uh, what happens if this happens right uh, so you might be able to catch that that's going on but it might be confusing like which one's supposed to go at the beginning and which one's supposed to go at the end that's really tricky I'm gonna give you a technique here for how to do those translations so let's uh, let's talk through that a little bit and I'm gonna erase that it is recorded for posterity on YouTube. Um, but let's look at some common English patterns. Oh, this is another thing I want to say first. Um, it might be tempting to use a word bank strategy when it comes to translating conjunction, disjunction, negation, um, even biconditionals. But, uh, you know, I'm advising against that, of course. I, I advised against that with annotations. I'm advising against that now, too. Um, but with conditionals, it's just impossible. There are so many English words and phrases that capture conditional relationships. We actually have a lot of ways of saying, of making claims of that form. So there's no way to present an exhaustive list. So instead, I want to give you a technique. I want to train you in a technique that will let you discover or figure out uh, how to translate any conditional, no matter how novel the language being used is. So that's where this is all going to go. All right, but here's some classic cases. So someone might say, if A, then B. Someone might also say, C. Um, or, uh, no, more like this. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, let's do it this way. C, if D. Some, uh, someone also might say E, only if F. I'm choosing different letters here for a reason. Um, actually, let's give ourselves some more space. Um, someone might say uh, G is a sufficient condition for H. Someone might say, I is a necessary condition for J, J, K, if and only if L, 
m is necessary and sufficient for n. Okay, so here's a bunch of them. And, and there's some variations here, like we say sometimes instead of saying g is sufficient is a sufficient condition for h, h, we just say g is sufficient for h, or i is necessary for j, stuff like that. Let's talk about how to translate all these. So if a then b, this is our really straightforward pattern that we've already been talking about, a horseshoe b. Here, c if d would be d horseshoe c. Saying C if D is just like switching around it grammatically. Um, if It's like saying if D, then C. Okay, And that's how to read the conditional. If the, if the antecedent, then the consequent. Now, here's where things get a little wacky. E only if F is not to be translated this way. That's wrong. So there, there's a kind of pattern with these first two where whatever follows the if shows up as the first thing, the antecedent. That doesn't happen with only if. This is actually going to be translated E horseshoe F. And why that's the case, if you've got here, if we've got some uh, questions about that, we can come back to that. I'm going to use that as an illustration. Oh, and I just realized, uh, poo, um, my webcam covers up what I'm typing right now. Okay, uh, let's just get rid of all this. We've already talked about it. You can rewind the video to check it out. Um, so let's move this up here. There we go. Now that should be in view. Okay. So now we got this thing. Um, G is sufficient condition for H, and I is a necessary condition for J. These are the ones that are really important to me. Um, I'm going to star these for you. These are your best friends. These are the ones you really want to know because they're part of this technique that I'm going to teach. So let's say you got some English. You got some English utterance and you can tell enough to tell that uh, you, you know enough about what, what you're able to pick up enough intuitively here to tell that the English sentence is uh, making a hypothetical judgment. It's making a conditional judgment, and it's uh, so it's somewhere in that realm. Um, but again, you're not sure what order to put things in. My advice is to translate it into another English sentence that uses language about necessary or sufficient conditions. And then you can use a technique to get it into formal logic that I'm going to show you right now. So this is a little like a it's a two-step process here. Uh, you go from there to there, and then you go from there to there. And the thing that's going to mediate this arrow right here is the sun principle. So you could take sun and flip that U to make it the horseshoe. Uh, that's how you can remember this. Um, and what it's saying is that the antecedent is a sufficient condition for the consequent. And the consequent is a necessary condition for the antecedent. Let's actually spell that out and put it on the whiteboard explicitly. Yeah. Here we go. So this statement or this logical expression encodes some information. Um, it's encoding that the antecedent, let's just say sufficient or the consequent, and that the consequent is necessary for the antecedent. Both pieces of information are embedded in just this one little logical expression. And I, I like to uh, kind of imagine it like these arrows. So, so the, the antecedent is sufficient for the consequent, and the consequent is necessary for the antecedent, like that. So that means if we've got a sentence that says G is a sufficient condition for H, 
if g is the sufficient condition, it's got to go in the sufficient condition spot. So it goes first, and we have that. And if we've got i is a necessary condition for j, a's got to go, or i's, i's got to go in the necessary condition spot, and j will go on the other side, like this. So you got i here in the necessary condition spot. So you can use the Sun principle to translate this language of sufficient and necessary conditions effortlessly. Now, because you know how that's going to work every time, that's totally clear cut. As long as you can get this English sentence that you're trying to translate into an equivalent English sentence that uses necessary and sufficient condition language, you're, you've got a foolproof method here for how to translate any type of conditional no matter what you're getting. Now. Um, it might be that talk of necessary and sufficient conditions uh, doesn't read right off the page here. So let's let's back up a little bit now and talk about uh, what it means to say something is a sufficient or necessary condition. If I'm saying G is a sufficient condition for H, um, I'm saying all it takes to make H happen is for G to happen. That's it. Um, I actually I have to check up on this one second. Okay, I just got a text message from my partner saying that my son uh, woke up from the nap on and it looked like I thought it read fell down the stairs. So I was like, oh crap! But actually, I just looked at it and it said uh, fell asleep on the stairs. So that's much better. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, where was I? Right. Um, so if I say G is a sufficient condition for H. I'm saying all it takes for H to happen is for G to happen. So let's use an example. Um, if you cut off my head, I will die. That another way I could put that, you know, I was wording it in in this kind of language up here, if A then B. But that same conditional is encoding this information here. It's saying cutting off my head is a sufficient condition for killing me. If if you are trying to kill me, cutting off the head is all it takes. You don't have to cut off my head and then hold my head underwater for five minutes or like shoot a bullet into it or something. Like cutting off the head will do it. That's a sufficient condition for my death. Um, or I might say something like um, eating a sandwich is a sufficient condition for me uh, dealing with my hunger. It's not the only way I can deal with my hunger, but it will get the job done. That's what saying something is a sufficient condition means. Saying something is a necessary condition is saying that this thing only happens this way. So saying I is a necessary condition for J is saying you don't get J without I. There's never a way for J to happen without I happening. So uh, let's, let's instead of drift away from grim topics of death, and let's talk about life. So a necessary condition for me being alive is that I have access to oxygen. Like there's oxygen in the, in the air to breathe. Um, that's a necessary condition. If I don't have, well, I guess I'm talking about death again. Uh, if I don't have oxygen, I'm not going to be alive. So, having oxygen is a necessary condition for me being alive. Is it a, a sufficient condition? No, not at all. If there's too much oxygen in the atmosphere, I will also die that way too. <laughs> That's also a problem. Um, or if uh, my head is cut off, you can have all the oxygen in the air around me that you want. Uh, that's not going to help me, right? So maybe that helps to illustrate the distinction here between necessary and sufficient conditions. Um, sorry about the bus. Um, something being sufficient does not mean it's necessary, and something being necessary doesn't mean it's sufficient. Um, and that's the same thing as what we remarked earlier of saying if P then Q is not saying the same thing as if Q then P. Those are separate statements. They have, they're have they presenting separate information. Neil, how are you feeling about this whole necessary and sufficient condition stuff? Cool. No. Um, in fact, what we're talking about right now uh, reflects what's happening here. So um, 
saying like if you cut off my head then I will die is a false statement if you cut off my head and I'm not dead or if you don't cut off my head that statement can still be true of me which is the case right now my head is not cut off and I am not dead and yet it's still true that if my head is cut off then I'm dead so it really reflects that yeah as it should uh, if it didn't there'd be a problem here with how we're translating this stuff um, I, I think some so sometimes I'm just aware sometimes this necessary sufficient condition stuff is tricky for students and so when I'm making this advice like oh if you find conditionals confusing here's a way to sort it out do this other very confusing thing that can be a tr that can be a problem um, so if you are uh, if anyone Neil you or anyone watching this video later if you're struggling with not not quite sure you got the whole necessary and sufficient condition thing like if you have a really strong grasp on it I would really encourage you to make a list of things that you think are necessary and sufficient conditions for other things in the actual world and send them to me and we can use those as a way to see if you got it or not um, try to make true statements about sufficient and necessary conditions as a way to test uh, your ability to understand that concept um, and then if I see something wacky there uh, we'd have some examples right at the ready to talk over on the phone if you wanted to do that but I, I really encourage getting strong on sufficient and necessary conditions because if you are strong about that then you can handle doing any of these other translations it's very very easy okay um, we have just a couple more things to talk about here um, and that's the stuff about uh, these two expressions K if and only if L well saying this um, here I'm gonna actually remove some stuff here so I got some more space to work with um, saying K if and only if L is like saying K if L and K only if L and now that we know how to handle those things um, we can figure out how to translate this and it's gonna look like K if L would translate as if L then K and another piece of information ampersand K only if L looks like this that's the pattern we've got here this pattern is the biconditional pattern oops it is that imagine again there's a triple bar there uh, the biconditional is just saying it's a two-way street if this then that and if that then this so this will get translated as a biconditional same thing for M is necessary and sufficient for N if we were saying um, M is necessary for N then we're gonna put it in the necessary condition spot and if we were saying it's sufficient for N we're gonna put it in the sufficient condition spot and there we go if you remember back to the Sun principle so that's the same thing as saying and oops like that and uh, let's get that other triple bar line in there there we go now I'm happy okay so uh, that's I handle by conditionals there the, I can say biconditionals are exceedingly rare they don't show up in our ordinary everyday conversations very much conditionals all over the place but not um, not biconditionals uh, the reason they get included in logic is that um, philosophers are very interested in biconditional relationships uh, they're related to like giving theories of things to identify the necessary and sufficient conditions for a phenomenon is basically to define it um, to define its entire parameters of existence its essence in other words and a lot of philosophy topics are all about identifying the essence of things what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for justice what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for knowledge what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for your existence as the identity that you have like all of these things are in that kind of world and because philosophers are responsible for logic uh, or have done most of the work on developing logic um, this is something we're really concerned about also the biconditional relationship helps us define logical statements too so it, it's a way I can 
show that two logical expressions actually have the same meaning. If one, then you get the other, and vice versa. Um, they're mutually, they mutually entail each other is another way to talk about biconditional. So it's got kind of a technical usage. Um, a really good example or illustration I like to use is when scientists try to define what life is. They're looking for the necessary and sufficient conditions for life. The conditions that if life is happening, those things are happening, and if those things are happening, then life is happening. Two-way street, right? These things always go together. Um, that's that's uh, those are those are what biconditional uh, statements represent. That's the kind of information you're getting, and why we would care to be tracking it. Um, but the very rarely it does ordinary argumentation uh, steer in this direction. Um, so I, I'm going to close here with a promise about explaining this E only if F sort of thing. So I wanted to use this as an illustration to run through our little system over here uh, to demonstrate it. I forgot to do that earlier. I, I apologize. Um, so E only if F. Can we translate this into some other English statement that uses talk of necessary sufficient conditions? So we could say something like E... Uh, is sufficient for F, E is necessary for F, F is sufficient for E, or F is necessary for E. Hopefully one of those four combinations will sound intuitive. It'll sound like it's not distorting the meaning of the original sentence. Neil, uh, do you want to uh, hazard a guess of uh, what E only if F, like what kind of English sentence that talks about necessary sufficient conditions would be equivalent? Okay, let's, let's just go through the list together. Uh, e only if F. E is true only if F is true. Um, is that saying E is all it takes for F to happen? E is sufficient for F. F, F is all it takes for E to happen? Yeah, that's right. Saying e, e is true only if F is true is saying F is necessary for E. There we go. Now we know that this statement sounds like F is necessary for E. Now we know what to do with it. We're going to slap F in the necessary condition spot. And that's what we did. And then the E will go on the other side. So that's a little demonstration of how that can look. Oh, like, yeah, no, 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 no. Um, uh, although we could do that, too. Um, th this video is getting long. Uh, we're, we're just crossing two hours here, so I'm thinking about wrapping it up. Um, let me... Um, well, I was just... I'm, I'm really low blood sugar, so over the break I, I ate some nuts that were chili-flavored. Um, so, and they were from Hawaii. Uh, my mom brought them back for me. So... Let's have the code word be Hawaii. Hawaii is the code word here. There, where's the camera? Come on. There we go. Code word is Hawaii for this video. Um, so I want to wrap this up, but um, we have gotten through all of the material that is needed that we need to talk about in order to set you up to do the homework problems for Chapter 6. Um, but I think that there's still... Still maybe some stuff to cover here, um, and some stuff that you might um, get uh, hung up with um, as you're trying to do the homework problems. I would really like to do many more demonstrations of homework problems for you, so you can see more practice at this. I, like I've said, I think learning logic is really a matter of doing it. You can't learn logic by just having someone talk at you at it. You have to be doing it yourself. That's how you really learn it. And to watch me do it is a step in that direction. Best thing is to give it a shot for yourself. Um, but my plan right now is on Thursday's lecture, I am going to press forward with the inductive um, argument stuff, the chapter 8, 9, 10. we got to keep moving if we're going to have enough time to get everything done this quarter um, in a way that you're not 
more rush than you have to be already because of summer quarter. I'm, I'm trying to keep this as reasonable as possible. Um, but uh, the way I've been doing these videos to like go over questions on the homework, um, if people want to post, I'm going to set up, no one's been using it, but or very few people have been using it, but I'll make another discussion board uh, entry for chapter six. And if anyone is having questions, like you're trying to do some some of these homework problems on your own over the next couple days, um, post on there if you're getting into trouble or you want to see certain problems performed, and I'll do that. I'll actually try to do that video on Friday instead of on Saturday um, to try to get you a bonus video here to follow up on the logic stuff. But I, I all the lecture material I've gone over. There's some other little bells and whistles, some tricks that I can show you, um, but uh, this is all the the sort of intellectual material, and the more the stuff I might want to follow up on will be more practical application and practice. So uh, you can count on that video coming out. Um, I'm depending on how my day goes tomorrow. I might even try to slip it in. Wednesdays are usually hard for me to have any breathing room at all. But if I'm able to do it, I'll get this supplement video just as fast as I possibly can. Um, but this really takes practice, and don't be shy about talking to me about Chapter 6. Uh, like I mentioned in the last video, um, this is a unit where I am used to seeing students struggle, and then uh, when we're able to work on it together or talk it over together or do some problems together, it goes much better. So, uh, and we're able, I, like I said, I've never had a student work with me and not figure it out and not ace the exam. So uh, if you're feeling weird about it, um, if you're trying to do it on your own and you're just like, what am I supposed to do, um, contact me and let's work it out. But you've seen everything that you need um, with the last two lectures. Um, you know, we didn't talk more about the step of evaluating arguments for validity in this video, but it's, it, you go back to the first video, there's really nothing else to say. It's, that is a total crank turning procedure. You just look at the chart and you're like is there ever a row where all the premises came out true and the conclusion false if so it's invalid if not it's valid there's nothing more to it than that that is absolutely it um, but I'll, I'll, I'll run some more problems and demonstrate them and you can see it in practice um, so stay tuned for that that'll be on the way um, Neil do you have any questions you wanna throw out there before we we close up shop Oh, yeah. So I talked about substitutions. Oh, I shouldn't have done that so fast. Actually, I, I want that. Um, substitutions were going on when I was talking about how operators glue together blahs. They, bl they glue together chunks. And those chunks could be anything. Right? So if we have something and something else. I mean, you received this as the form P and Q, but this form right here could stand for anything. It could stand for, it's the same form that would be true for A and B, but it also would be true of the C or D and not C and D, right? The uh, exclusive disjunction pattern. Like both of these have the same form to them. It's something and something else. That's it. So when the book is talking about a substitution form, they're saying the P and Q pattern applies equally to this thing as to this thing. This is just a more complicated P and Q pattern. This blah and this blah. That's the that's the that's all that's going on there. Yep. Oh, you know what? This is something I could put into the next video, but I'm just going to do it now because you might be confused on the homework. Let's say you're asked to do a truth table for just a single expression, not a full argument, not like you saw in the last video, uh, but just a, a simple thing. But it's a little bit more complicated than what we've seen so far because it's got this going on.
So we'll keep it pretty simple here. Uh oh. What do we got here? We've got a P in that expression. We've got a Q in that expression, but now we got an R. I mentioned at the start of this video that you can do truth tables for more things. However, it gets more complicated. There's more possibilities, a lot more possibilities. It increases exponentially. And you can't calculate the truth value of this whole expression until you know the truth value of all of the component parts, not just P and Q. You got to know what's happening with R as well. And I told you that the number of possibilities can be defined as 2 to the nth power, where n stands for the number of letters. Here we've got 3, so we've got 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. What is going on? There we go. 8. Now, capturing all those possibilities is obnoxious. And you actually are going to have um, uh, problems on the homework and on the exam that will ask you to deal with three propositional letters. I won't ask you to go to four because that's just 16, it's a lot, uh, or five would be 32. That's way too much. So uh, three is the most, but I'll have you do three. I'll, we'll do two, we'll do three. There's a really easy way to make sure you're catching all the possibilities and not leaving any out. And this is the way to do it. Take the total number of possibilities that you, you know are going to be present, in this case 8. Make the first half true. So 4 true, and then 4 false. Boom. In the next column, take that number, cut it in half. So instead of going 4 by 4, we're going to go 2 by 2. Like that. And then we're going to keep doing that, keep cutting it in half every other column we have to deal with. Whoa. There we go. If you use this method, <clears throat> then you're not going to leave out any possibilities. If we had another letter on here, like S, that means we've got, uh, we're going to have 16 possibilities. You're going to have... 8 true, 8 false. Is that 8? 1, 2, 3, 4. Yep, one too many. There we go. And then in the next column, you would have, you, you'd go, instead of going 8 by 8, you'd be going 4 by 4. So 4 trues, 4 falses. 4 trues, 4 falses. And so on and so forth, like this. So this no matter how many letters you have to deal with, you can always make sure you've got all the possibilities, you don't have any duplicates, you haven't left any out, um, and you don't have to worry about it. And it makes it a lot easier for me to grade your answers on the exam if they're all in this kind of standardized format. So for your sake and for my sake, please do it this way. Um, that's that is definitely the instruction I would give you. But check it out. We got the possibility where all, all of them are false, the possibility where all of them are true. We've got the two true, one false, where R is false. Two true, one false, where Q is false. Two true, one false, where P is false. We've got the two falses where P is true, two falses where Q is true, and the two falses where R is true. So we've got all the bases covered, right? And um, this technique is foolproof. Use it every time. Uh, this is this is not supposed to be a logic puzzle. <laughs> it's just setting things up. Then you got to do the calculations, okay? Um, and right now, uh, like I said, I've got some tips and tricks to teach you, but I'm not going to give them to you yet uh, because, one, I don't recommend using them until you feel really good doing it the long way like I demonstrated today, uh, the, where you crunch it out on scratch paper. Do that first. Only when you're getting really comfortable can you start using the tricks. Um, but I will, I'll present those in the next video that I do when I review some homework problems. Um, and, uh, and the tricks can be very helpful. And they teach you something about logic as well. So it's cool. All right. That's all for me. Neil, anything else from you? I will talk to you about that in a second um, after I stop the video. 
uh, but we can definitely make that happen. And any of you out there on YouTube, um, I've been inviting it every single time, but I will keep inviting it. Please contact me. I am here. I am your servant. I am your helper. I am a resource. Take advantage of me. Um, I want to be there for you. So um, find some way to get a hold of me. Um, so we can talk about that right now, Neil. So I will see you all later on Thursday, probably. Maybe, maybe tomorrow. More likely Thursday, though. Bye-bye.